actions and effects session. Our first, first speaker will be uh, Yijo from Cornell. Okay, thanks for the introduction. I'm Yijo from Cornell University, and I will be telling you about our work on making effect handlers abstraction safe. So programming languages typically build in a fixed set of control flow uh, transfer features. For example, C Sharp builds in support for exceptions, async await, and coroutine iterators. Quite recently, algebraic facts have emerged as a unifying language abstraction that allows programmer-defined control effects. They subsume legacy control flow features such as exceptions, and, and they also bring numerous other possibilities. This generality has created a growing interest in algebraic facts from both the research community and industry. There are full-fledged language designs, and there are also many library implementations. So to summarize, algebraic facts are gaining steam. But as I will argue, the current semantics for algebraic facts is incompatible with modular reasoning, and it can cause implementation details to leak through abstraction boundaries. And this talk is going to be about why this is the case and how to fix this serious modularity problem. But first, let me tell you a little bit about algebraic facts from the programmer's perspective. The generality of algebraic facts comes from the ability to define signatures for effects. For example, we can define, uh, we can define an effect signature called yield. This signature is parameterized by a type parameter E and contains one effect operation. This effect operation takes an E and returns unit. Using this algebraic fact, we can define an iterator for binary trees in a declarative way. We iterate the left subtree, we yield the current value to the client, and then we iterate the right subtree. Static checking of effects requires us to put that effect in the function header using a throws clause. And this effect will be propagated to the caller of this iterator. The caller then needs to handle this effect by providing an implementation for each effect operation in the effect signature. Here, the handler simply prints the element and resumes the iteration. Just like exception handlers, algebraic effect handlers are dynamically scoped. This means that when the yield effect is raised, the runtime searches the dynamic context for the most recent handler that can handle yield and it transfers control to that handler. And after the handler prints the element, control will be transferred back to the place where the yield effect was raised, so the iterator will continue to traverse the right subtree. So this is the current operational semantics for algebraic facts. And I will show that it's precisely this dynamic scoping of handlers in the operational semantics that it can break an abstraction. So consider a higher order abstraction called size f that returns the number of elements satisfying some predicate f in a binary tree. In general, the computation embodied in the functional argument f may be effectful, so we introduce an effect variable alpha to abstract over the possible effects f might raise. Because size f must somehow apply f, static checking requires us to also include alpha in the effects of size f. And I will use this slash notation as a shorthand for throws. Now, what if we want to write a message to a log every time size f applies f? One way to do this is to use the yield effect. Here, g is a wrapper of f. It's an L expansion of f, but g also raises a yield effect before redirecting to f. The client code then passes g to size f. So this invocation of size f has effect yield, which the client handles by logging a message. You would think that when g yields, the yield effect will be propagated all the way to the client code in a blue box and be handled there. However, this will not happen for particular implementations of the higher order abstraction size f. So consider one such implementation that uses a filtering iterator. This filtering iterator called iterf 
is obtained by modifying the iterator we defined earlier. We iterated the left subtree. We yield the current value only if the value satisfies the predicate f. And we iterated the right subtree. This particular implementation of size f then counts how many elements are yielded by this filtering iterator. It increments the counter every time either f yields a value. Handlers are dynamically scoped. When g yields, the most recent handler for yield on a stack is no longer the one in the client code. Instead, it is the one in the function size f. So size f will handle this effect by accident, causing the counter to mistakenly increment by one. So this accidental handling behavior is bad. And what's interesting here is it's not a type safety issue. The program is well typed, and the running this program does not result in a runtime error. So the question is, what is the property that we want our language to have in order to preclude this possibility of accidental handling? To recap, we have two clients of the same abstraction. Assuming the value stored in the variable n is the only observable behavior, then these two clients ought to be equivalent, since g is simply a wrapper of f. However, we are able to make different observations about these two programs. These different observations reveal implementation details about the higher order function size f. They tell us that size f must be doing something special internally with this yield effect. This insight suggests that accidental handling is really an abstraction safety issue. <coughs> that is, it causes implementation details to leak through abstraction boundaries. In this sense, the current semantics, the current operational semantics for algebraic facts is fundamentally broken. And given the speed that algebraic facts are gaining popularity, it's imperative that we fix this modularity problem now. So to fix this problem, we give a new semantics, a new tunneling semantics for algebraic facts. Tunneling does not require any changes to the program. On the left is our old program. But with the tunneling semantics in operation, when g yields, the effect is immediately tunneled to the handler in the client code instead of being intercepted by some intermediary context. This tunneling semantics is deeply motivated by modular reasoning. For example, because size f is polymorphic to the effects of its functional argument f, the handler in size f is locally oblivious to any effects f can raise. So it's impossible for size f to accidentally handle any effects raised by f. By contrast, the client code is locally aware that applying g can raise yield because the type of g says so. So the client code is obligated to provide a handler for yield. And this makes unhandled, uh, unhandled, uh, unhandled effects impossible. So this local reasoning sounds useful to the programmer, but tunneling still seems like the programmer's wishful thinking. How does the runtime know which handler to tunnel effects to? The most straightforward way to convey this information to the runtime is by finalizing the choice of handlers before the program even runs. Choosing handlers statically implies the need to name handlers. In fact, the try with in the client code is syntactic sugar for naming the handler explicitly. The name of the handler is in scope within the corresponding try block. In the meantime, a function like g, which has a throws clause, expects its client to provide a handler to handle its effects. So a throws clause, like throws yield, is syntactic sugar for declaring a handler variable. This handler variable will be instantiated by a concrete handler at the runtime. Now that we have named all the handlers, picking the right handler for an effect operation is just as straightforward. In G, invoking the effect operation requires a handler to be provided. This handler is resolved to the lexically closest enclosing binding for yield, 
which is the handler variable we declared. Correspondingly, because G is parameterized by a handler variable, the reference to G in the client code needs to be supplied with the handler. And this handler is again resolved to the lexically closest enclosing handler binding for yield. This way, the runtime knows that upon invocation of the effect operation in G, it should transfer control to the handler provided by the client code. While this desugaring process is useful to the compiler for type checking purposes, there's no need for the programmer to use this more verbose syntax. It is always possible to automatically generate the handler bindings and resolve an embedded handler to the lexically closest enclosing binding. A handler transfers control somewhere else after it finishes its job. For example, handlers may choose to continue the computation in a try block. Other handlers, such as exception handlers, abort the try block computation and they continue the computation in closing the try block. In both cases, the to be continued computation becomes ill defined after the try block exits. So for type safety, we must prevent using handlers outside their try blocks. In fact, there are library implementations that support algebraic facts by passing down handlers, but they are not type safe because it's possible for handlers to escape their lexical scopes. And to address this problem, we turn to the classic idea of a region-based type and effect system. In such a system, the type of a computation is annotated by the regions it must have access to in order to do its job. The type system then uses these annotations to ensure that a memory region is never accessed outside its lexical scope. In our setting, we want to prevent access to handlers outside their, lex outside their lexical scopes. So the type of a computation is annotated by the handlers to which the computation must have access. In our running example, this annotation is the highlighted part in the signature of G. But like handler bindings, such annotations are automatically generated during the desugaring process. So no changes to the surface syntax are needed, and the programmers can keep writing and reasoning about their programs in the way they already do. So I have showed how to make effect handlers type safe and abstraction safe. But this being popular, we want to formalize what we have achieved, that is, in addition to proving type safety, we want to substantiate our claim that tunneling is good for abstraction. Abstraction safety is about having desired equivalencies hold. For instance, we want to show that these two clients of the same abstraction size f are equivalent under the new tunneling semantics. So we need a notion of equivalence. The gold standard for equivalence is contextual equivalence. Two terms are contextually related if they cannot be distinguished in any program context. And we take one of the standard approaches to establishing contextual equivalence. We define a logical relation for a core language, and we show that the contextual equivalence and uh, the logical relation coincide. Then we can show two terms are equivalent by showing they're logically related. The definition, of our, uh, uh, the definition of our logical relation needs some care. Because it's possible to have recursively defined effect signatures, the language allows no termination. So to make the logical relations definition well-founded, our logical relation is indexed by remaining evaluation steps as well as by the structure of types. And because the small step reduction rules are dependent on the surrounding evaluation contexts, we use the bioorthogonality trick, which uses a notion of evaluation context relatedness to define expression relatedness. We prove that this logical relation satisfies parametricity. Intuitively, for parametricity to hold for a language with type polymorphism, polymorphic functions cannot make decisions based on the runtime instantiation of the type variables. Analogously, parametricity of effect polymorphism demands that 
an effect polymorphic function not make decisions based on the effect it is instantiated with. And the previous semantics for algebraic facts violates the abstraction precisely for this reason. A polymorphic effect alpha is handled by searching the dynamic context for a handler that can handle the runtime instantiation of alpha. We also prove that our logical uh, we also prove that logical relatedness implies contextual equivalence, and we mechanize these proofs in Koch. These results provide a sound reasoning process for showing equivalences between programs that you that use effects and those that don't. For example, we can show these two programs from our run example are equivalent. This result is not possible with the previous semantics for algebraic facts because it, does, it doesn't prevent accidental handling. This kind of equivalence result also justifies compiler, compiler transformations that optimize away such uses of effects. Dynamic scoping is known to have modularity problems. Early languages such as Lisp uh, supported dynamically scoped variables, but dynamic scoping has largely gone out of favor because of the variable capture problem, which can be viewed as an instance of the more general problem of accidentally handled effects. Tunneling offers the power of, of dynamic scoping in some sense, but without breaking abstraction. Our work, uh, our prior work on the design and implementation of an exception mechanism identifies the problem of accidentally handled exceptions and uses exception tunneling to address this problem. Tunneled algebraic facts generalize tunneled exceptions and our use of a region-based type and effect system generalizes the second class types that we use in our prior work. At last, Popo, Birnaki et al. introduced an, an alternate approach to abstraction safety by using a lift operator they also define a sound logical relation and we borrow useful ideas from it. Any effects arising from a lifted expression will bypass the dynamically most recent handler. But this approach requires the programmer to annotate the programs with lift and it relies on making a subtle restriction to the sub-effecting relation. And I believe the next talk will be about how to infer such lift annotations automatically. So to conclude, algebraic facts are a powerful unifying language feature, but existing designs for algebraic facts have failed to support the fundamental principle of modular reasoning. The consequences are leaky abstractions and subtle program bugs. We introduce tunneled algebraic facts to address this serious modularity problem and give a rigorous account of abstraction safety by proving parametricity. And we hope this work will offer guidance to future language designs that aim to support algebraic facts with a strong abstraction guarantees. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, before we start the question session, I'd just like to note that Yiju is uh, on the academic job market this year, so. Just plug for that. So uh, let's get things kicked off with a question from Slido. Um, the most popular one is, how do you deal with use cases where a higher order function needs to intercept some well-known effect and change how it is handled? For example, example filtering print. I don't know what filtering print means, but... Um... So maybe there's an effect for print. So uh, and you, you want to have a, a kind of a high order function that takes as input a thunk and just calls a thunk, except while the thunk is running, if the thunk prints something, uh, everything becomes uppercase. I'm sorry, uh, okay. can you ask a question again? Yeah, sure. Maybe we can take that, that one offline. So I liked your historical perspective, but you said 
right? We used to have dynamic binding for variables, and then we discovered this was a bad idea, and we replaced it with lexical binding, and you made an analogy. But can't we just call what you're doing lexical binding for handlers, or does it differ in some way from lexical binding for handlers? I think we are essentially doing lexical binding for handlers. So why didn't you call it that? Um, so I think... And, and also, right, you've got these extra H parameters that sort of get added in mm -hmm. and then instantiated appropriately. You don't normally need to do that for lexical scope. You just say it's lexical scope. So why is something so much more complicated needed here? Couldn't we just say it's lexical scope? Uh, I don't think it's so... Oh. Thanks. <laughs> that is a powerful question. Um, <laughs> um, so I don't think our mechanism is much more complicated than lexical scoping. It's, it, is, it is lexical scoping, and what's also there is an implicit mechanism that allows you to infer the amenity handlers. Um, and I think this, uh, this implicit mechanism provides some of the uh, expressive power of uh, those dynamically scoped mechanisms. So in the interest of keeping things on track, uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. Let's thank uh, our speaker.